What's up, how you doing? I am David Long. Today I'm gonna to be sharing a clip with you from a video I made a little while back where I'm basically comparing Jordan Peterson, Ken Wilber, and Sam Harris. This is the second half of the video where we're mostly gonna be talking about Ken Wilber on Sam Harris. Basically, we're just gonna be comparing their integral credentials. I hope you enjoy. I respect Wilbur as one of the founding fathers of Integral, and I think he mostly gets it right. I think the ways he gets it wrong, he ends up breaking his own rules in favor of his bias. So it's not that he's not a smart guy or that he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's just that he doesn't act it out perfectly or apply his methods perfectly. Let's continue. And Green didn't transcend and include orange, transcended and repressed orange. That's the definition of pathology. You know what, though? That's Ken Wilber's problem, too. He ignores a lot of science that disagrees with his perspective and favors some of his spiritual Eastern bias and then corrupts the whole project. So Ken Wilber is not immune to these criticisms either. I think that in a lot of ways, even though he can make a lot of integral distinctions, he commits pre-trans fallacies and has certain issues that really mess up his whole worldview. That's a literal color. That's not a symbolic thing. There's something in you right now that existed prior to your parents' birth. And it's that sense of I am this. The journey of enlightenment, if you want to put it in a simplified form, is the journey that moves you from your empirical self, anything that you can see or know about yourself, any object, to pure awareness, pure self, your true self, the self that cannot be made an object, but is the space in which all of this is arising. That's a literal koan. That's not a symbolic thing. Joseph Campbell, probably the recent era's greatest mythologist and interpretive mythology, and somebody I certainly cut my teeth on. I was a great admirer of his and a really extraordinary work that he did. He used to very, very uh, vehemently, actually, say that there's really sort of two types of mythology, or mythology forms two different functions. He wouldn't use the terms pre-rational and transrational, but the way we're talking about them is the way he would talk about these two functions of mythology. And the first function is when mythology is taken to be concretely real. But what some people do, particularly educated, intelligent people like us that are trying to get some meaning in our lives, we can tend to take myths as deeply symbolic of something else. So that's a very distinguishing way to tell the difference between pre-rational myths that are taken to be concretely, literally true, and trans-rational myths as deeply symbolic. That's a literal koan. That's not a symbolic thing. There's something in you right now that existed prior to your parents' birth. And it's that sense of I am this. And the problem, again, with the pre-trans fallacy, way too many people take a lot of the pre-rational stuff and elevate it to trans-rational glory it just doesn't have. Fundamentalist, religious believer, they don't take these things metaphorically. These are not symbols of some higher truth. These are the truth. That's a literal koan. That's not a symbolic thing. Would you draw my Wilbur? <laughs> That's why I'm saying these little distinctions make so much of a big deal, because holding on tight to one little blue idea and trying to sneak it in will mess up your whole project. You cannot hold on to any of your biases if you really want to be an open, honest, skillful philosopher. You've got to be completely open to whatever is actually good and true, and whatever proves to be the case. And if someone says, I can prove you wrong, you got to be like, all right, I'm excited to see that. That means if you're right, I'm about to learn something. So it's good. If you're really open and honest, all you'll ever be doing is learning and expanding. To say you were wrong is to admit that you're wiser now than you were before. But the problem is you can't really measure these interior left-hand subjective and inner subjective realities very well. You can measure exterior matter well. And so the more science kept going forward, the more the enlightenment ended up almost accidentally with an official philosophy of what's often called scientific materialism. And Here we so, go. And so, yes, we believe in the whole interlocking order of nature, but only as far as you can see it in an objective materialistic. This is where Ken Wilber starts to bring out his normal straw man of science. Like most serious scientists that we respect, like Dawkins and Harris and Dennett and all these people, they are not these simplistic materialists like Wilbur is saying. They're not reducing reality to that which you can grasp in your hand and measure. The reason Ken Wilbur is going down this road is because he believes in Eastern idealism and he basically thinks that spirit is extra stuff, not this emergent property, consciousness coming online through time, through life, through form. He thinks there's this extra stuff before the Big Bang, this being of beings. He has this religious view. And so as you get that sense of ongoing I amness, it's no objects whatsoever. And it is absolutely infallible. You don't don't complicate it. Don't if you're aware of I am, that's it. That's it. This ongoing, ever-present knowingness called I amness. And it existed now, five minutes ago, five years ago, five decades ago, five centuries ago, for the big man. And before the universe was. And that is the fundamental, absolute secret of the great tradition. 
this dogmatic Hindu view of I amness before the Big Bang. And so he strawmans science so that way he can dismiss a lot of their perspectives in favor of his religious biased dogmatic idea. So this is actually the core of Wilbur's problems. And you can check out my Ken Wilbur debunk series. I mean, obviously you can't debunk a person completely, and I agree with a lot of what Wilbur has to say. But it's called uh, What You Talking About, Wilbur, and episode three is about I am this before the Big Bang, and it explores this problem in detail. I will continue on. It's very interwoven. It's just all exterior objective truth. So it has no interiors. No interiors. There's no beauty. There's no morals. There's no There's beauty no or morals. aesthetics. There's no love. There's none of that. You think that any of these scientists are going to be like, there's no such thing as beauty or love? Like, come on. Nobody thinks this. None of that fits into a standard systems theory. Doesn't work. They would just say it's hard to measure. They transcend and include. Literally, molecules go beyond atoms, but they enfold them. They actually include them. Molecules don't hate atoms. They don't oppress atoms. They don't exclude atoms. If anything, they love them. I mean, they're actually hugging them. This is where he starts reading in interiority into things that don't have interiority. They're literally hugging them. They love them. Love is not just a feeling, but this drive towards unity actually goes all the way back to the Big Bang. So this sounds like fun and poetic language and poetically, sure, but he means it literally. He seriously means this. When you listen to him talk more, you will hear it. He literally says this stuff. So Piaget tended to focus on cognitive development. Colbert tended to focus on moral development. Maslow tended to focus on motivational development. Jane Lovinger focused on ego development. But the stages were essentially similar, and you could map those across all of these lines. And one of the ways that Wilbur goes really wrong with a lot of this stuff ends up corrupting the stages of development, ending up breaking up the partnership between him and Don Beck, is trying to stack or state stages on top of Piaget to create a third tier of development using the tier language of spiral dynamics and completely divorced from the regular meta-analytical methodology of looking at a bunch of developmental psychologists who are doing a bunch of different actual scientific tests that are cross-culturally validated. He's just going to throw a mystic into the mix. I reject all of this. Ken Wilber's assumption that mystics represent the highest stages of development and the integration of Orobindo's third tier stages. It's yet another example of Wilbur attempting to exploit the Graves model and spiral dynamics. He lacks entirely the seventh code, integral, and has no idea how, when, where each of the codes have emerged. I will gladly challenge him to a public debate, but he still hides out in his loft in Denver. The whole idea of tears is uniquely language from our work, which he steals in order to market his. The man lacks any ethical basis when he does so. He is nothing beyond red, blue, and orange. If he wants to develop his own system, then he should do so without exploiting my lifetime of work, which he continues to do. Our seventh and now emerging eighth codes of second tier are functional, resolve real world problems, and emerge out of life conditions. Not out of some mystical realm from Eastern viewpoints which belong to those cultures, not to Western societies. The eighth code is beginning to take shape, and it will not be the sixth code, green on steroids as many in the integral world believe. Don Beck. It totally ends up corrupting the whole thing, and then other people, like this guy, Leo from Actualize.org, makes a whole series of videos about spiral dynamics and shares the corrupted model. Anyways, I digress. Integral theory represents this development as a spiral. In this film, we'll mostly be talking about amber, tribalism, ethnocentric, authoritarian, which first emerged about 5,000 years ago. So one thing that I find to be kind of annoying is that we're talking about amber and not blue. Spiral Dynamics uses the color blue, and it does this for a reason. The colors are meaningful. When you move back and forth between warm and cool colors, that means something. The colors represent something. The warm colors are individualistic and the cool colors are communal. So when Wilbur changes the spiral to try to match the rainbow or something like that, he's just messing with other people's maps and he doesn't help them in doing so. Also, integral is yellow, not teal. This is not the spiral dynamics map. Wilbur has perverted that map. Don Beck is pissed because Wilbur is perverting his map and going around and spreading perverted versions all over the place. Constant perverted thoughts. It's some of the things that he leaves out. I find this a little bit interesting. 
because he's clearly an integral thinker. How is he coming to this conclusion that he's an integral thinker? Ken Wilber loves to do this. Other people have been critical of this in the past. I would love to see him cut the socializing and the endless, I call this celebrity and I call that celebrity. And I talk them into integral. <laughs> and in the end, we agree so much. <laughs> Why? Disagree. That brings the, the, the clash and the insight and also the qualification. He never debates or argues with anybody within the community or really deals with any of the criticisms in public or anything like that. Off on his own, he'll be critical of somebody, but not to their face and not in like a real debate kind of situation. If you check out Integral Life content, what you'll find is that Ken Wilber loves to have people on, say how much we agree about everything, and then convince them that they're integral already. This is a good sales tactic but it's not really honest. And it's also a great way for Ken Wilbert to basically tell Jordan Peterson's fans, if you agree with Peterson, that must mean that you agree with me and you're probably integral, so you should buy into this. This is a thing that he does a lot. He goes around and he tells people you're already integral as a way to get them to buy into his philosophy. Part of this is kind of true because you want to appeal to people's highest nature and it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's not necessarily such a terrible thing to do except for it dumbs down the standards of the community because people think that they don't have to do the work to actually learn the theory to really become integral. They just say, oh, well, I already am integral. It's like this vibe, you know? It's like you can tell who it's, who's conscious and who's not. Uh, yeah. And so then all of the green plus stages just gets convoluted into this like, oh, it's all integral, which is basically a lot of new age, even postmodern thinkers and stuff like that. Actually, I don't really think that Jordan Peterson's fans would be hugely into a lot of the stuff in integral. Jordan Peterson is really Christian. He swings heavy in that direction, which gets a lot of the conservative stuff going. Ken Wilber is really Buddhist. He's into the Eastern ideas. So their cosmologies are different. They're not going to agree about religion or healthy integration of religion. Like Ken Wilber's definitely going to say that Peterson leaves out meditation. Peterson is perfectly aware of waking up, but he doesn't really talk about that. A lot of the integral community is actually new agey, postmodern, touchy-feely, woo-woo types. I would say about 30, 40, maybe 50% of people who say they're into integral actually know the theory, actually can make some of those distinctions. Few of them really know the stuff and apply it in their life. So I think there are couple problems with this sales tactic of telling everybody that they're integral. It gets people in the door, but it can dumb down the standards and dumb down the community and slow down progress. It confuses the community. It's a problem. So in terms of any number of individuals in the dark web who, again, most of them, I think, are operating with integral cognitive capacities. No, a lot of these people are not. Some of them are, like Sam Harris, I would say, is one of the really leading edge people. But then there's people like Ben Shapiro, who is super conventional blue orange. Just because he doesn't fit into like the normal boxes doesn't make him integral. His argument with Sam Harris is Harris focuses exactly on what they're saying. And he says, and that's wrong. And so he'll actually criticize Moses really parting the Red Sea. And he'll say, that's just false. We don't need it. Get rid of it. Sam is doing it because he, he's not an eliminative materialist, but he does still tend to kind of reduce everything to third person determined causality. And there's no room for freedom in that at all. And so he'll take all of those actual literal statements of religion leading up to science and he'll say all of that is just flat out bloody wrong. It has no business being there. It was a stupid mistake we made from the beginning. It's still around. We've got to get rid of it. Nothing good. This is just a straw man. If you actually listen to their conversations, this is not Sam Harris's actual point or argument. You said, I still considered the world's religions to be mere intellectual runes maintained at enormous economic and social cost, but now I understood that important psychological truths could be found in the rubble. Well, I'm trying to find the important psychological truths in the rubble. We have to decide also if we agree about that. Are there important psychological truths to be found in the rubble? Well, absolutely. Sam believes that what should happen is that the poetic and fictional domain should be supplanted by the rational domain. Let me just close the loop there. Okay. Not quite. I think we need poetry and fiction. Then there's more to engaging with reality. 
personality than being a scientist in a white lab coat. But we need to be able to clearly distinguish fact from fantasy or fact from the imagination. And we want to be rigorous there and rational there. It's not that there's no place for mere creativity. Let me see if I can sharpen up what my concern actually is here, because it's not even true to say that I think you need to get rid of the Jesus story. I don't even think there's something problematic with orienting your life around the Jesus story. I think that that can be reclaimed. A tarot reading can be truly powerful. This is built on something, right? This is not just a massive example of self-deception on the part of people reading and people getting their cards read. These cards can seem prescient. I could give you all a reading right now, and 95% of you would find what the cards would say to be relevant to your lives. There's a way of understanding the utility of using a device like this and the real effect it has on you. I mean, if I turn over the cards and ask you to look at your life in this moment as though for the first time through this lens, of course it's going to be valid. My main concern is that at no point do you have to lie to yourself about your state of knowledge about the mechanism. He recognizes that some of this stuff could be useful, but he worries about the ways that it can get into dogmatism or the particular harmful ideas of a tradition. And he doesn't hear Peterson making skillful distinctions around this stuff to help to protect from these concerns that he has. So he is totally willing to say, hey, if you want to see the Jesus story as poetry and the metaphor of the Christ and I should be the Christ and I should see myself as Jesus and live like that in the world, like if that's useful to you and you can do that in a way that's not superstitious or harmful and that doesn't get caught up in these bad ideas, then he's totally fine with that. It's just that he wants to hear Peterson say that this stuff isn't literally true to make some real distinctions around this stuff and quit trying to weasel around it. And he's altering from that third person deterministic scientific sense. And Peterson is always going to, wait a minute, there are these interior left-hand subjective and intersubjective realities. Again, Peterson is schooling Harris on intersubjective realities. No, Harris is schooling Peterson on how to put those intersubjective realities into context. Harris knows very well that there are subjective and intersubjective realities. You are so dismissive no, no. of subjective experience. I'm not, I'm which not has remotely given dismissive rise to of poetry, it. to music, to art. So dismissive of subjectivity. There's nothing more important than subjectivity. The changes in our conscious experience are all we care about. Values are a certain kind of fact. They are facts about the well-being of conscious creatures. One of the problems we have in discussing consciousness scientifically is that consciousness is irreducibly subjective. And we can't reduce the experiential side to talk of information processing and neurotransmitters and, and states of the brain. People want to do this. Someone like Francis Crick said famously, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. That misses the fact that half of the reality we're talking about is the qualitative experiential side. So when you're trying to study human consciousness by looking at states of the brain, all you can do is correlate experiential changes with changes in brain states. But no matter how tight these correlations become, that never gives you license to throw out the first person experiential side. That'd be analogous to saying that if you just flipped a coin long enough, you would realize it had only one side. And now it's true you can be committed to talking about just one side. You can say that heads being up is just a case of tails being down, but that doesn't actually reduce one side of reality to the other. We have very strong third person, quote, objective measures of things like anxiety and fear. Bring someone to the lab, they say they're feeling fear. You can scan their brains with fMRI and see that their amygdala response is heightened. Measure the sweat on their palms and see that there's an increased galvanic skin response check their blood cortisol and see that it's spiking. These now are considered objective third-person measures of fear. But if half the people came into the lab tomorrow and said they were feeling fear and showed none of these signs, and they said they were completely calm when their cortisol spiked and when their palms started to sweat, these objective measures would no longer be reliable measures of fear. So, so the cash value of a change in physiology is still a change in the first-person conscious side of things. And we're inevitably going to rely on people's subjective reports to understand whether our correlations are accurate. So the hope that we're going to talk about consciousness shorn of any kind of qualitative, internal, experiential language, I think is a false one. So we have to understand both sides of it, subjective and objective. So when Harris talks about facts, he's including interior facts. So what Sam really doesn't like is magic and mythic views of ultimate concern. He doesn't like them in Islam. He doesn't like them in Christianity. He doesn't like them wherever he sees them. It's not that he doesn't like them. It's that he wants to see society outgrow them. He wants to see real distinctions made in society to make our culture more healthy. He wants to outgrow the unhealthy expressions at these stages of development. It doesn't make sense for the right reason, and that's why it's not a, a reliable guide given other changes in the world. But with everything changing, you want to be making sense for the right reason. Useful fictions have to be retired at a certain point. Useful truths stay true. The doors leading out of this kind of fundamentalism don't open from the inside. 
they get bashed open from the outside. And it's humanism and it's secularism and it's scientific rationality that has exerted such pressure now for multiple centuries. That's why we're not encountering the Christians of the 14th century on a daily basis. And he's right, because we are more mature than this now. We do need to be making better distinctions. We do need to have a better culture. Actually, Harris is really good about not just not liking religious ideas wherever he sees them. He definitely makes clear distinctions where he says Christian ideas are bad because they are bad for like things like stem cell research, whereas that's not so much of a problem with Islam, but Islamists have all these problems with suicide bombs and whatnot. And like the more extreme dogmatic fundamentalist you are as a Jainist, the actual less violent you'll be, the less you'll want to hurt something. So he's not just equally against all religious ideas. He understands that certain traditions and certain religious ideas within those traditions are more harmful than others. He's looking at these things in a larger context. He's not coming from this simplistic religion is bad kind of perspective. At the time that they existed, it was in a sense the best we could do. But today, yes, you can do better in many cases using a type of scientific third person approach. But there still are all these interiors and they still have various rules and patterns that govern them. And you can't get those just through an objective view of science. And that's where Sam is always holding out. It's not that Sam is holding out. It's not that he denies interiority. He's a neuroscientist. He has done all kinds of studies on religion where he correlates interior phenomenological reports to measurements in the exterior in people's brains. I was in the middle of my PhD in neuroscience where I was studying belief. I was actually scanning people's brains and studying the difference between believing and disbelieving various propositions, religious and otherwise. It's just that he's a scientist. That's what he does. Science is the best way to know facts about what's true in all four quadrants. This is why there's an interior and exterior in every quadrant. In integral epistemology, zone is because there's some kind of systematic way of getting at the truth of every quadrant and that that means a scientific approach to every quadrant. So it's not at all about denying interiority. One of the things you did say in the moral landscape, and I think this is associated with your interest in spirituality, is that there is some baby mixed in with the bathwater. And the question is, how do we distill that out? Yeah. And the objections that you're raising are the objections that are, look how difficult it is to do the distillation. It's like, yeah, absolutely, Matt. It's clearly still developing. My point is, we should be able to agree that having a worldview guided by a continuous, honest engagement with reality, and so far as we can apprehend it, is better than having a worldview solidified or anchored to unchanging ideas that were born of people who had none of our present tools, none of our present insights into anything. When Ken Wilber says that he still won't come around, maybe this is what he means. People like Deepak Chopra will tell you that in the darkness of your closed eyes, you can realize your identity with the one mind that gave birth to the cosmos. This is a specious claim. There's nothing about meditation that is akin to doing cosmology, and you don't get insights about what preceded the Big Bang from doing any of these practices. But this is where we encounter you know, true intellectual atrocities. You know, I've studied with great mystics. I've met great meditation masters who've spent 20 years in caves perfecting the kinds of techniques of meditation that you would adopt or recommend. They don't know a damn thing about physics. Having an experience of undivided consciousness does not tell you what consciousness really is. There's nothing about introspection that leads you to sense that your subjectivity is at all dependent or even related to voltage changes and chemical interactions going on inside your head. You can drop acid, you can meditate for a year, you can do whatever you want to perturb your nervous system. You can feel yourself to be one with the universe, and at no point in that transformation do you get a glimpse that there's 100 trillion neurons in your head or synapses in your head that, that are doing anything. It's called absolute subjective ignorance of what's actually going on outside your consciousness. The last thing I want to say just very quickly is that both of them are fully aware of waking up, and neither of them include that in their argument. Are you kidding me? Harris's podcast is called Waking Up. Named after a book and a talk that he did called Waking Up. But recently he changed the name of his podcast to Making Sense, so that way it wouldn't be confused with this new meditation app that he's coming out with. So yes, definitely Sam Harris includes Waking Up. This man has developed a meditation app. He does include it in his argument. It's very much a part of what Sam Harris is always talking about. So to say that he doesn't include it is like, what are you talking about, Wilbur? <laughs> Wilbur doesn't listen to enough Sam Harris, apparently. Clearly, he's strawmanning his position pretty hard here. And it's weird, because the actual super core of a spiritual system is the system of waking up. It's not developing a series of beliefs. Even the Christian mystics would do more like what St. Paul said. Let this consciousness be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, that we all may be one. See, this is where Ken Wilbur starts to do that thing I was talking about, where he wants to act like all of religion 
Zen is actually trying to say Buddhism. He's trying to conflate all mountaintops to be into the mountaintop that he favors. What always happens when people want to push the great religions into one box, into one mountaintop, rather than many mountaintops, is you come up with your own ad hoc idea of what mountaintop is. Oops, it just happens to be my vision of what religion should be. So maybe it's there's ultimately there's one God who maybe sounds and talks and walks a lot like Jesus. Or, you know, maybe it's the mystical experience, which just happens to be the piece of religion that you value. Or maybe it's it's compassion, which just happens to be your particular preoccupation with what the religion should be doing. But in any case, it's you. Fundamentally, every major wisdom tradition wants you to move from an identification with finite phenomenal events, absolute subjectivity. Christian mystics also believe in state training, which is waking up, which is the main thing of religion, when actually this is the main thing that Ken Wilber values. It's not the main aspect of religion. And according to the Wilbur Combs Matrix, whatever state experience you have is always understood from whatever stage of development you're at. And we only ever have our own worldview to interpret whatever experience we have. And so part of Wilbur's problem is, is that he's still interpreting his spiritual experience as validating some traditional dogma, the idea of I amness before the Big Bang. I have a video on it. You can definitely check for links below. This is Wilbur main problem, and we see it here. Wilbur's view is actually a lot closer to Sam Harris's view, but he doesn't see that because Sam Harris is more scientific, more materialistic, and Wilbur's got bigger allergies and negative reactions against Sam Harris. So even though Sam Harris would agree with Wilbur a lot more, because Peterson is an idealist, Wilbur's actually more sympathetic to Peterson's view sadly enough. In terms of the overemphasis on translation, Integral has created all kinds of hacks. Integral Christianity, Integral Buddhism, Integral Business, Integral Recovery, Conscious Capitalism, and Conscious Consumerism. So all of these hacks into the current systems that we already have. But we hear very little, if anything, about what new transformative integrative systems of the future might look like. And I think Sam Harris actually points us more in this direction in a more reasonable way than Wilbur does. Sam Harris isn't encouraging all of us to just become Buddhist. He wants to find some new integrative tradition that takes the best from spirituality, from religion, from all practices, and says, this is human spirituality. This is human stuff that works for everyone everywhere. And to me, that's more integral. It's inconvenient for me as an atheist that when someone dies, or when someone comes time to get married, or when you're looking for a rite of passage for your 13-year-old to experience, the only ready-made rituals and frameworks for that are religious in some form. I think we need to transcend sectarianism, ultimately. I think whatever is to be discovered in the present moment that's profound is, by definition, non denominational. I think that the truth is deeper than any of our traditions, and I think we have to get out of the religion business as it's been practiced for thousands of years, and we have to find a language that is truly global and truly transcends the accidents of birth. It can't be that by virtue of birth, people in India or Mongolia don't have access to the truth that can be realized in the present moment. And so whatever rituals we have that frame these moments in life that are profound and I think need to be framed in a way that separates them from the rest of our superficiality, I think we need beautiful buildings and we need moments in life where we engage our ethical depth and what's most important to us, whether it's community or the transience of life or you know, our hopes for our children, uh, whatever it is, there's more than what we tend to access in our superficiality. But I think a thousand years from now, or even a hundred, we need to find a moment where we have left our sectarianism behind. I view the secular project as being that ultimately. In the dark web, who, again, most of them, I think, are operating with integral cognitive capacities. Notice he didn't say that Sam Harris is also integral, even though he's a part of the intellectual dark web. Because Sam Harris is a scientist, Ken Wilber is going to say that he's an exterior quadrant reductionist and reduce him to orange. This is where Ken Wilber's bias starts to show in his assessment of these guys. That's a fairly good description of ultimate unity consciousness. That's why around the world there are various at least sub-branches of religion that know about this. And it's called enlightenment, awakening, Sanskrit, it's moksha, pure freedom, it's satori, it's the great liberation. Enlightenment, awakening, satori, all of these are Buddhist words, man. Oh, you're like, really, it's all Buddhism. Dude, bad in integration, bias integration. This is how even Ken Wilber gets it wrong because he doesn't have a skillful, fair, overarching methodology. He's got a bias integration. This is what my second What You Talking About Wilber video is about, how different people who claim to be integral want to reduce it all to their bias to the tradition that they like. And then when we try to apply that on a larger scale, how it ends up being a major problem. This is why we really have to integrate diversity with discernment in a fair, overarching way 
right because when we start to apply it as the new next system, if it's biased, it's going to be unhealthy. It's going to be problematic. It's not going to be really universal. And so getting it right like this is super important. This is the problem with both Peterson as integral and Wilbur as integral. They both want to act like their tradition is the one true way, which is the marker of first tier thinking. With Wilbur, it's Eastern dogma about the creation myth. With Peterson, it's Christianity, and it messes up the whole integration process because you start looking at everything through that lens and integrating according to your bias, which means that you're not giving equal or fair emphasis to all traditions. Now, you said that I've been approaching this, say, from a, from a Christian perspective. That's true, but there are reasons for that. It's the problem of multiple interpretations. It's the postmodern problem, is that there's an infinite number of potential interpretations. What do we do about that? I tried to use a consilience approach. So I I looked at multiple religious systems, I looked at Christianity, I looked at evolutionary biology, I looked at philosophy, I looked at neuroscience, and I looked at the literature on emotion and motivation, and literature on play that was very nicely delineated by Piaget, and I tried to see where there was a pattern that repeated across all dimensions of evaluation. If it manifests itself here, and here, and here, and here, and here, six places, and it's always the same pattern, then the probability that that pattern exists independent of my delusional interpretation is radically decreased. Yeah, my claim, however, is that many of these things don't repeat. In fact, they're flipped around completely based on different religious assumptions in different cultures. If, if Hinduism and Christianity are irreconcilable, then there must be a deeper level of reality that explains why they both work, that can't be reducible to Christianity being true or Hinduism being true. Okay. This is crucial because if we still have people that really are at values, that are absolutely committed to not integrating everything, then you're not going to get them integrated because they're all first tier. They can't solve that problem ever. By definition, first tier thinks that its values are the only correct ones. But second tier, that has the inherent capacity to see the importance of all of these. And so that's why a second tier integral orientation becomes so important. All right, so basically we have a bunch of vague talk about how Jordan Peterson is integral as a way of taking a popular figure in the zeitgeist and using him as a means to teach people about integral and especially stages of development. I do think this is a worthwhile project. I myself have done it in many videos using Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris as a means to talk about integral because they're both so close and even seeming like if you put them together, maybe they could together somehow equal an integral perspective. I, I do think there's something to that, but I digress. So just as I finish editing this video, Rebel Wisdom comes out with a new Ken Wilber video about Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris and their arguments about truth. And if you remember this painting right back here, you remember that I made a video about that when it first happened. And Wilbur completely misrepresents the argument between the two. It's not a valid form of argumentation. So I decided I'm going to include and address some of the topics in this video, though I'm going to kind of steer clear of the free will versus determinism debate, and then Alyosha and I will pick up that thread later in the Integral Review series. So look forward to that, and let's get into the content of this other video. Another key concept from Integral Theory can perhaps resolve the well-known dispute between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, where they couldn't even agree on the nature of truth. From this perspective, Harris was insisting on a scientific, objective definition of truth, while Peterson was more interested in a cultural definition, truth as culturally agreed and transmitted through myth and story. For Integral, both are right, but incomplete. They do tend to emphasize different quadrants, and if they kind of push into each other that there's some real core agreements, they really are differentiating in large measure according to these different quadrants, these different perspectives that they are taking as most fundamentally real. They acknowledge the others, but they tend to really come back and emphasize those particular perspectives, especially when the other person isn't including them. And that tends to be the way the argument goes. Is Sam will argue that that's just not right, and then Jordan will say, well, that's just not right. And so they get into that kind of lockup, even though they both sort of acknowledge the existence of all of them. So this is a complete mischaracterization of what the argument between the two is about. This fits Ken Wilber's narrative really well, but it's not actually true. If you go back and you listen to the actual original podcast, what you're hearing is not a left-hand versus right-hand quadrant discussion. What you're hearing is a map versus territory discussion. Before there was any understanding of the energy trapped in an atom, the energy was still trapped in the atom. Basically, Sam Harris is saying there is an absolute territory, even if it's not useful for us, there is still a truth. If there are scientific things that we 
could mess with that might destroy us all, it would be better if we didn't. Okay? Yes, but they will be no less true. You clearly have to have a conception of facts and truth that is possible to know that exceeds what anyone currently knows and exceeds any concern about whether it is useful or compatible with your own survival even to know these truths. Okay, well then I would say that I don't think that facts are necessarily true. <laughs> so I don't think that scientific facts, even if they're correct from within the domain that they were generated, I don't think that that necessarily makes them true. I know that I'm gerrymandering the definition of truth, but I'm doing that on purpose. Sam Harris gives a bunch of really good examples, constantly pointing back to the fact that there is a fact of the matter, as he likes to call it. What he really means is there is an absolute truth. Even if we haven't yet discovered it, he says, there is a truth of the matter, even if we never discover it. See, this isn't talking about exterior quadrant scientific facts. He says that there's a fact of the matter about what JFK was thinking before he died. So we're not talking about exterior quadrant stuff. We're saying that there's a truth of the matter. There is an isness, as Ken Wilber would say. The good, the true, the beautiful, they all have an isness factor. And that's what Sam focuses on. And Sam Harris was saying that there's a problem with reducing everything down. You're not noticing the price you're paying for redefining a word like truth. And ironically, it's probably even a steeper price than what these gender pronoun maniacs are attempting to pay for asking that everyone use their favorite word to describe their identity. It's possible to survive without having a clear notion of truth, but it's probably not possible to be reliably understood in a conversation about scientific reality or anything else that we're trying to talk about here. It seems to me what you're doing here is you are marrying the concept of truth, which is a epistemological one, also the concept of goodness. And maybe you want to freight it even more with the concept of beauty. You're going to fuse truth and goodness and even beauty together as this jewel that can't be spoken about in terms of its separate parts. Take my terrorist. We could put you in a situation where knowing something or not knowing something would get you killed. And yet the fact that it would get you killed doesn't reach into the truth value of the statement. If there's someone going around Toronto killing people for not being able to name all the U.S. presidents in sequence, and let's say he's wrong about what the sequence is. So if you give him a sequence that is in fact inaccurate, that is untrue, but it works for him and you survive, it doesn't make it true. It makes it true enough to survive. It's not like you don't put your arguments forward with power and coherence. It's, they're powerful arguments. And I'm not saying that I'm right. You are saying that you're right in the sense that you're not persuaded by the argument here. It seems to me that you have to grapple with this. Or at the very least, I need to move forward knowing exactly what you're claiming here. And I, I don't believe that I do. Sam Harris is basically saying to Jordan Peterson that his whole conception of truth is self-defeating and that he has to end up appealing to this other kind of truth to even make sense of what he's talking about and so he winds up weaseling his definition. Basically Jordan just says that this is the game he's playing and even if it is inconsistent and incoherent this is how he's going to play it. He's decided to play it this way. It's basically his belief system. This is another claim of faith I suppose but when we're starting to mess around with the definition of fact and true you get down to the place where you have to make axiomatic presuppositions. And like I said I talk about this stuff in my original video, and I explain it much better than Ken Wilber did in detail. You should check that out if you're interested in hearing more about that. Let's continue. Sam, even though he'll say things like consciousness is real, consciousness is the only thing that can't be doubted, you can look at consciousness in a kind of objective way, and there are subjective truths, that kind of stuff, he still has a tendency to interpret what that means from a third-person deterministic fashion. So this gets back to the idea of realism. Yes, Sam Harris is a realist. Sam Harris is also a scientific academic, and so this means he's not going to make claims based on personal belief or beyond his ability to know. And so he's going to be a hard agnostic until he can prove it because that's the kind of reasonable and rigorous approach academics take. If only Ken Wilber took this kind of an approach, I would have a lot more respect for him, and he would actually be a lot better at doing integral. What happens with Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson is how they come down on that side of this ultimate mystery of what's happening. And however much Sam acknowledges that ultimate unity consciousness and its subjectivity is real and all of that, he does tend to come down on the side of third-person objective realism. So in the same way that Jordan Peterson is a lower left quadrant reduction, Ken Wilber is an upper left quadrant reductionist. His Eastern spiritual ideas have him thinking that all the world arises in consciousness and basically that the upper left quadrant is primary. But you're aware of this room right now. This room is arising in your awareness. You can hear my voice. That's arising in your awareness. These are all objects arising in your awareness. All the things that you're aware of is the world of fourth. Whether it's me or my voice or the backdrop or this world when you can see the clouds, you can see the mountains. That's all the world of fourth. The world of fourth is arising in your awareness. The awareness that you have is a kind of vast space in which everything is arising. The seer or the witness, the awareness, that itself is nothing you can see. In other words, you can see sights, but you can't see the seer. So the witness is that which is aware of everything that's arising, but you can't see the witness. If you can see the witness, that's just another object. First thing you notice about the witness is it doesn't have any qualities itself. 
It's just an empty space in which this is all arises. So emptiness is not a concept. That's exactly what emptiness is. It's not a thought or an idea or a concept. It's this vast, transparent openness in which everything is arising moment to moment. And yet also realize it's all arising within you. Clouds are arising in you. The mountain isn't out there, it's in your awareness, it's in your being. The mountain is a texture of yourself. Ken Wilbur is the form arising in my awareness. Just like this chair is arising in my awareness, the room is arising in I am that awareness. I am not Ken, I am not the chair, I am not. The world is illusory. Nature is illusory. Gaia is illusory. Ecology, all illusory, all part of the world of form. Brahman alone is real. Emptiness alone is real. Your primordial self alone is real. So you have to disidentify with objects and find this ever-present witness that you are. And that's also your original face, the face you had before your parents were born, the face you had before the Big Bang. Once you find that, that's the Brahman alone is real. Brahman alone is real. Brahman is the world. See, this is where it gets confusing. Ken Wilbur likes to paint Sam Harris as an exterior quadrant reductionist, even though that's clearly not the case. But right now, I'm saying that Ken Wilbur is an upper left quadrant reductionist to some extent. But it's also clearly the case that Ken Wilbur takes into account all four quadrants. So what's going on here? This is a claim about primacy. This is a claim about ontology and cosmology and the origins of the unfolding of the quadrants. Ken Wilber, he's going to say that the quadrants tetra arise in consciousness. So the four is to rising in your awareness. So all of this is happening in consciousness. The empty space in which this is all arises. From his perspective as an idealist, the world isn't real. The world is a persistent illusion that arises in consciousness. So of course you want to work to alleviate suffering, and you want to work to alleviate hunger. But on the absolute side, the analogy is if you're in a dream at night and there are thousands of people starving, there are two ways you can stop their hunger. One is in the dream, you can try to feed them all. But the second is you can wake up, and that will end their suffering immediately. He thinks that when you awaken, you realize that basically the world isn't real. This is part of his literal Buddhist way of thinking about things. And so this corrupts his view. Not only does it corrupt his view, but it kind of messes up his ability to really care enough to get involved in the world, which is why a lot of people have never even heard of Ken Wilber. Ken Wilber and Sam Harris both talk about state training and waking up, but they do talk about it a little bit differently. Sam is a longtime practitioner of mindfulness, there are many different kinds of meditation. The kind I've done is traditionally a Buddhist practice. Many people know of as mindfulness. And I've done this on retreat where you go into silence for weeks or even months at a time. And so he describes this deconstruction of the self where at a certain point the center drops out and there's just the world. The way I talk about the self is one where the punchline is that our conventional sense of self is an illusion. It's an illusion that you can cut through neuroanatomically when you just look in the brain. There's no place in the brain for a unitary self to be hiding. There's no one place in the brain where everything comes together, where there's a rider on the horse of consciousness who can appropriate everything and experience. Anatomically, that doesn't make sense. But as a matter of direct first-person experience, I also think it doesn't make sense. When you interrogate the sense of self through a technique like meditation, it can fall away. You don't feel identical with your body. You very likely feel like you have a body, that you are up in the head and you're riding around in your body like it's a vehicle. The sense that you're located in the head is also the feeling that you are the thinker of your thoughts, that there's a thinker in addition to the next thought that arises. Not only do thoughts arise in consciousness, but you feel like you're the one who they're arising to. You're the man in the boat riding the river of consciousness, whereas there really is just the river. There is no boat bobbing on the river. There is just the flow of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, all of the energy that is arising in this moment in consciousness. And anything you can call a world is part of that. The sense that you're on the edge of the world looking at it behind your face. Your face is a kind of mask and you're behind it and then there's the world. That can break down. If you look closely enough at that, that can drop away and then on some level there's just the world. And I view every spiritual career ultimately, even explicitly religious one, Christian ones or Sufi ones or Hindu ones, moments of self-transcendence have this character of losing the sense of being separate from the world, losing the sense of being separate from your experience. And that's the way consciousness is intrinsically it just it takes some work to, to recognize it. And I've heard Wilbur talk about things in a very similar way before. But when he talks about I amness before the Big Bang and this kind of nervy Kalpa Samadhi type of experience, he's talking about not a waking state kind of realization, but the kind of experience that you would generally have with your eyes closed and a still mind. He interprets it as there is just I amness. There is just pure witnessing awareness. There is just consciousness. So while Sam says, there's just the world. That can drop away, and then on some level, there's just the world. There's just the universe in flux. Wilbur says, there's just I amness. The world is illusory. Nature is illusory. Gaia is illusory. Ecology, all illusion, all part of the world of four. Brahman alone is real. Emptiness alone is real. Meaning, there's just consciousness, and everything that arises, arises in consciousness. This is the primary disagreement between the two. And I actually think that Sam Harris's side is actually more reasonable and in touch with integral theory, while Ken Wilbur betrays his theory in favor of his bias.
bias. It's not a claim about the metaphysics. It's not a claim that the, the universe is made of consciousness. Yeah, I'm kind of agnostic as to what the relationship between consciousness and the physics of the world is. And we certainly don't understand it at this point. But as a matter of experience, there is just consciousness and its content. So yes, Sam Harris is a realist, but not because of some dogmatic belief, but because that's what the evidence seems to suggest. There's a false assumption about science operating here. Science is not in principle committed to the idea that there's no afterlife or that the mind is identical to the brain or that materialism is true. Science is completely open to whatever in fact is true. And if it's true that consciousness is being run like software on the brain and by virtue of ectoplasm or something else we don't understand can be dissociated from the brain at death, that would be part of our growing scientific understanding of the world if we could discover it. And there are ways we could in fact discover that if it were true. The problem is there are very good reasons to think it's not true. And we know this from now 150 years of neurology where you damage areas of the brain and faculties are lost. Everything about your mind can be damaged by damaging the brain. The way in which our mind is parcelated at the level of the brain is not at all intuitive and there's a lot known about it. When we look at the evidence within the context of science and a valid theory, through the quadrants, we can track and correlate the development of interior capabilities to tangible exterior hardware that makes those things possible. And so if we could know all of brain neurophysiology, at some point he explicitly says, then we would understand all of evil and presumably be able to fix that. And again, that's just pushing it way, way, way too far. He says it's pushing it way too far, but look what he actually said. There are truths to be known about how human communities flourish, whether or not we understand these truths. And morality relates to these truths. So in talking about values, we are talking about facts. Now, of course, our situation in the world can be understood at many levels. There's the, from the level of the genome on up to the level of economic systems and political arrangements. But if we're going to talk about human well-being, we are of necessity talking about the human brain because we know that our experience of the world and of ourselves within it is realized in the brain. So the contributions of culture, if culture changes us, as indeed it does, it changes us by changing our brains. And, and so therefore, whatever cultural variation there is in how human beings flourish can at least in principle be understood in the context of a maturing science of the mind, neuroscience, psychology, etc. This is the integral project. Then an enlightened society would include ways to help us do that. We want to be able to understand using the Western Enlightenment project, science, and our best maps to figure out how development goes wrong, how we can fix these potential problems and spot issues early on and fix them before they get way out of hand. Like part of, I think, what we would want to do in an integral society is to figure out optimal development and work people through that. And that's all going to be reasonable based on this cause and effect type of thing. And here you are, Wilbur, basically saying that this is an unrealistic and unreasonable project. You're cutting your feet off, man. You're cutting the legs out from underneath this integral project. This is the kind of stuff that we need to be working on. And actually, Sam Harris is out there on the front line actually being willing to put himself in public, talk about these things, and advocate for them. If anything, Sam Harris might be the most public and best voice of integral depth and span utilitarianism that we can actually point to as a public figure who's talking about these things, who's reaching a lot of people. I get annoyed the way that he's so dismissively talking about Sam Harris and giving Jordan Peterson such high praise when it seems pretty clear to me that Sam Harris is actually doing a lot better, is a lot more integral, and a lot more healthy than Jordan Peterson. But I digress. How we get to those is different from how we get to a mere objective understanding. Did you hear him say a mere objective understanding? As if there's measuring stuff with science, like you can have that mere objective understanding of a something, but the real experience you'll have, the real knowledge of it is this first person experience. The reason we have a scientific revolution was because first person experience is the least reliable type of experience, which isn't to say it's not valid. If we're talking about an exterior tangible reality, science is the best at knowing about that thing. If it's a thing, science is the best at knowing about it. So how we understand that atoms make up molecules is different in terms of how we understand what you and I should be doing. There's an overall type of truthness to whatever we're saying. There's an isness to whatever we're saying. So even if my values arise in my awareness, if I'm aware of them, they have an isness. They exist. They're phenomenologically real. And so I can say, well, that's the isness. That's real. And then the same is true for the good, the true, the beautiful. They all have an isness factor. And that's what Sam focuses on. That's right. And part of Wilbur's problem is when it comes to skillful integration, he's looking in the wrong quadrant for data. He thinks he can prove facts about the origin of the universe and the development of consciousness by closing his eyes and looking at his still mind. 
through the lens of Buddhism. This is not skillful integration. He's not even really true to his own theory and his own maps, and that's the problem. He doesn't say, well, there are things that are ultimately true, and he focuses on the isness of that, and that's what we should go for. And again, that's fine. But the methods that you get to those isnesses, those are still different. And Sam is focusing on those right-hand exterior approaches. So we've covered this. Sam's a neuroscientist. He understands the difference between phenomenology and empiricism. We're just gonna move on from this. You have two fundamental, unprovable choices about how you want to view this relative world as it's arising. And there either is the creative advance into novelty, or there isn't. He frames it here like, even though there's not good evidence, he believes it because it seems to explain things from his perspective. Yeah, but the problem is that his perspective is too heavily influenced by Eastern mysticism and Buddhism, and so there's a major bias, and that's why he wants to accept this minority-held position over what the majority of actual scientists think. And he basically ends up being like a Buddhist creationist, which is incredibly embarrassing. And that's one of the main reasons why you don't hear about integral in academia. It's not just that academia rejects stages of development. It's also that the way that Ken Wilber presents a lot of this stuff, some of his woo-woo ideas and his Eastern bias is getting in and it becomes problematic. And that's part of why it doesn't get academic respect. And I find the creative advance into novelty much, much more reflective of the world as it is arising. And in terms of any sort of ultimate truth, that's where the waking up the traditions simply come down and say, actually, you can't say anything about the relative world in an ultimate truth, because all of our concepts make sense only in terms of their opposites, pleasure, pain, good, bad, infinite, finite, up, down, in, out. So all of our concepts are based on opposites, but ultimate reality has no opposite, so we really can't conceptualize it. And that's another type of opposite. Everything is opposites, but this is beyond opposites, because that's the other opposite. It's just like, you're still thinking in terms of opposites, and you really haven't got outside of your cultural conditioning to really see this thing. When I first came across Wilbur and I was hearing him speak about awakening, I was definitely giving him the transrational benefit of the doubt. But after a while, I started to notice that he's always talking about it in Buddhist terms, never Christian terms, or even like the philosophical language of existentialism. It actually took me a while to figure out that the reason he's always talking about it in terms of Buddhism is because he's a literal dogmatic Buddhist, because I know Ken Wilbur can make those distinctions. But what I would kind of expect for an integralist to do would be to talk about it in the terms of multiple traditions and cross-translate, like a multilinguist. So for example, I would consider myself to be a Christian, I would consider myself to be a Buddhist, I would consider myself to be an atheist, as well as a hard agnostic. To me, as an integralist, these are all compatible and they harmonize in a way that makes perfect sense. I'm going to argue that Ken Wilber's ideas here about I amness before the Big Bang and Eastern Enlightenment are both rootless and fruitless. They're rootless in that they're not supported by good logic in the first place, and they're fruitless in that they don't actually bring any of this ultimate knowledge to the table. It's like the realization of emptiness, and now I really know nothing. Super helpful. Thanks a lot. It's like these people who like channel aliens and yet they don't ever bring any kind of like powerful new knowledge to the table that's like, whoa, that really changed our perspective. He's making these claims to absolute knowledge, but they're unfounded claims verified through circular reasoning and they're basically a literal interpretation of dogma, so no good roots, and they reap no fruits. There's no benefits from knowing this. It's great if you can get an existential awakening. It's great if you can learn some skills to be able to focus and get control of your mind. That's super good. But these things are not knowledge of the absolute truth of reality. I mean, come on, get out of here with that. And the real genius of Mahayana Buddhism, this whole notion of emptiness, is that you can't literally say anything about the relative world that will end up being absolutely true because you'll always end up contradicting yourself. Take any characteristic you want. It can be free will or it can be determinism. It can be consciousness or it can be matter. It can be truth or it can be falsity. And call that X. And then he demonstrates that reality actually is neither X nor non-X nor both, nor neither. That nothing you can say about the world is ultimately correct, including what I just said, and including what I just said there, and that too. And now you're right back into the green swamp. What can we say about anything? Very useful. Thank you for that. All of Mahayana Buddhism and virtually all the world's mystics agree. And virtually all the world's mystics agree. No. 
No. Virtually all the world's mystics agree on methodology, but virtually all the world's mystics come to different conclusions using that same methodology. Back when I was a Christian, I could totally see myself saying, you know, look, I can't logic you into this. I can't explain it to you. It's not gonna make sense if I sit here and try and tell you. What you have to do is you have to come with me to church. You have to worship with me. You have to open your heart and you have to see if Jesus speaks to you. And until you've done that, until you've opened yourself in that moment and been there and had that experience, then you don't know. But we all know what the problem with that is. Even interpreting it in that way in the first place is circular reasoning, like the fact that I experienced Jesus proves Jesus. And we all agree that just because I went to church and had an amazing spiritual experience doesn't prove that Jesus exists. This is the same exact thing that Wilbur is doing. He's trying to be like, well, until you've had this spiritual experience and you agree with me, then you just don't understand. And you can do all the science in the world that you want, but until you've had this first person experience of Buddhism, you just don't know. I have the absolute truth. You have like a well-defined relative truth. That's what he's doing with Sam Harris here. He's pretending like he knows everything, even though he can't actually say anything about it. And he ends up betraying his whole project here with this one idea. Very sad. In order to see this ultimate reality, you have to directly experience it. You have to actually awaken it yourself. And until that happens, everything you say about it is small because you're just not in touch with it. So you can say, well, it's God, it's not God, it's atheistic, it doesn't matter. You still don't know it, so everything you're saying is ultimately not right. And you keep doing that until you awaken the second mode of knowing that plugs you in to this direct first-person experience of a ground of all being. That's called enlightenment, that's called awakening, and that really is a mystery. It can neither be called void nor not void, but in order to point it out, we call it the void. Come on now. Are we here to talk about getting people to become Buddhist, or are we talking about what healthy integral is about? This is where Ken Wilber betrays his methodology. This is not a good example of integral methodological pluralism. He's looking in the wrong quadrant for data. He's qualifying the unqualifiable. It's a pre-trans fallacy number two, and I discuss all of this in my What You Talking About, Wilbur? I Am This Before the Big Bang video. You should check it out. Let's continue. And the whole point of that is you keep doing these meditative practices until you awaken that mode of awareness, and then you have this direct experience, and it can neither be described as deterministic or free will, causal or free, and that's the ultimate state of a Buddhist or mystical orientation. Did you hear that? That's the ultimate state of a Buddhist or mystical orientation, conflating everything into Buddhism. Right back to it. You can still give your relative arguments about which seems to work best in the relative realm. And that's why I say that a creative advance into novelty turns out to be probably the best way to describe that. Unfortunately, scientists don't agree with him that this is the theory with the most explanatory power. He even winds up quoting some creationists. Listen to what one of Wilbur's most long-standing critics has to say about this. I see it now as a community who celebrates a certain body of ideas, but not in a very critical way. And as strange because the claims and the statements made by Wilbur and his students are meant to be scientifically valid, so it's quite obvious that you need to apply rationality to it in every kind of way. So in my website, Integral World, I've tried to embody that, and for 20 years now I've posted critical reviews of Wilbur and his ideas on the website all around the topic of evolution. That's a large domain, of course, but it is very central to integral theory because Wilbur even started to use the label evolutionary for his every activity, where at first integral was the label and the brand, it was now evolutionary. Compare that to the fact that he has actually zero understanding of the basics of evolutionary theory and the very few things he has written about it are worse than an average creationist would dare to write. So that is a really horrible situation, intellectually speaking. The same thing with physics, because Wilbur believes in his beloved eros in the cosmos, and that means a force behind the whole trend towards complexity and consciousness. For my side, I see that as begging the question big time, because that way you never have to explain how these things emerge. You just say there's a force behind it that does it. In science, that's a no-brainer. And even in complexity science, nobody would say that has any kind of validity as a cop-out. In fact, there are many interesting ways to explain the emergence of complexity, from the very small to the very large. And in no way do we need to resort to easy so-called explanations like there's a spirit behind it. That is the end of science and the end of rationality. The areas of biology and physics are relevant here. In biology, Wilbur is just a crypto creationist who has not even done his homework and he tries to score his points as a politician with soundbites and slogans and ridicule. He has, I think, not even an interest in the field. He doesn't care about how birds fly or the human eyes evolved or species separate. For him, the only point that counts is that he can maintain there's a spirit behind everything thing and the spirit can be contacted and then this is the basis of modern spirituality. For me that's just a non-relevant approach to the question where does complexity come from?
And there are so many interesting answers out there. No final answers, but interesting and substantial answers that don't beg the question. And that for me, this whole approach is very unfruitful that Wilbur has taken. And it shows him as a kind of spiritual ideologist who just wants to promote his idea that there is an eros in the cosmos. The same goes for his dismissal of the famous second law of thermodynamics, which says that in the cosmos, things even out, they balance out. Heat and cold, all kinds of gradients flatten in the end. Wilbur says in A Theory of Everything, hey, but simple observation tells us that things go from from simple to complex, so that's a ridiculous idea, as he would call it later. Things go the opposite way. But if you really study that field, you see that both could be true. There's a paradox that even in a universe that burns itself up, stars burn until they have used up all their hydrogen. Complexity under certain specific conditions can arise. And it's especially this, this paradox that is interesting. Wilbur wants nothing about this. He just dismisses the second law and says there's a trend towards complexity, and there's even a spirit behind that. Well, here again, he's completely out of touch with science. And that's really embarrassing for somebody who has a better education and he should know he should know better than that. But the fields are very big and I'm not claiming to have a very expert knowledge of it. But even as an amateur, I can find so many holes in his writings that it's embarrassing. If this is really just totally obvious, it wouldn't be a perennial, unsolvable philosophical question. It does come down to that mystical notion that ultimately all of these concepts are based on opposites and ultimate reality isn't an opposite. So you're always going to get caught up in these kinds of arguments and you're never going to be able to argue them fully. The only way you're going to be able to know the real answer to any of that is to experience that pure ground. And then that will solve the issue for you in a direct and immediate sense. Just ending on Buddhism. Here to talk about integral, but Buddhism. The guy that got in the Texas Tower and shot up a bunch of people, he told his jailers that when he died, do an autopsy because something was wrong with his brain. And they did found a tumor. And so Sam will say, when we really understand everything about neurophysiology, we'll understand all of evil behavior, just like this tumor is causing Whitmore to do that. I said I was going to steer clear of this free will stuff, and I'm, I am going to try to. But just the problem with that is it's just too extremist a version of it. Because even if the tumor tended you towards antisocial behavior, it didn't say, get in this particular tower at this particular time using this particular gun, shoot exactly these many people, cause exactly these many deaths. But that's a deterministic mechanism that he demands in order to interpret what's arising. So this is getting a little bit ridiculous. Obviously, he's not saying that the tumor causes everything in this man's life. And the reason he chose that shotgun or that tower or whatever, those are also deterministic. They probably have a lot to do with proximity. And he also goes on to say this. The whole notion of some degree of freedom in itself is very hard to describe adequately. Because as soon as you say what that free choice is, you can always come up something that preceded it and it was outside of your control and so you never really look like you have freedom. In the integral view we have what's called a cosmic address which is simply when you add up all of the various dimensions that a particular holon is at, what its quadrant is, what its level is, what its line is, what its state of consciousness is, what its type is, that gives you its sort of location in this manifest universe and all of those constrain your activity right now. They're all determining it to some degree. So yeah, there's that. He answers his own question. If you actually push that deterministic position it really gets into problems and doesn't work very well. I mean, we went from just simple quarks to the sonnets of Shakespeare. The undeniable fact of that is that novelty is just all over the bloody place. And if you have strict determinism, you can't get that. It's not going to happen. And that's just a ridiculous claim. He has this idea like, if you don't have souls, if you don't have free will, there won't be novelty or evolution. Ken Wilber still believes in reincarnation. Anybody who's a parent has three children knows that they come with souls. And they are 80% formed. And you treat them all the same, and you've got a doctor, a bank robber, and a serial murderer. It's absolutely mind-boggling. The easiest way is to just say reincarnation. They come with this repository. They come with souls. He believes there's a soul. He believes that there's this spirit underlying everything. He still thinks that there's some extra stuff, even though there's no good reason to think that, and we don't really need to postulate any extra stuff in terms of actual explanatory power for why things work. So Ken Wilber rejects determinism in favor of some really flimsy version of free will to salvage and include his soul spirit stuff. Somebody like Emmanuel Kant wants to get you from a position that he considers unfree, other directed. Your thoughts aren't your own. You're a conformist. You're part of the herd mentality governed by other people's thoughts. And you can tell if that's happening. Or if you're self-determining, creating your own thoughts, you're having your own viewpoints, you're not conformist. You're not other determined. It, almost none of the believers in free will believe that there's maximal autonomy. That just means you're radically free and have no constraints on you whatsoever. Almost everybody that believes in some sort of free will believes that there are constraints. So getting a meta perspective on your perspective is not a view from nowhere. It's still a heavily conditioned perspective. And if anything, learning about Buddhism or whatever, that's just more 
cultural conditioning. So as you learn and develop more up the spiral, you're getting more and more cultural conditioning. There's no getting out of it and making a choice beyond my conditioning. No, we are heavily conditioned beings. Everything we know and think about everything we think because we've been taught to think that way. Everything we know has been communicated to us by someone else. We are social creatures. There's a really good video series I like called Everything's a Remix. I would highly suggest that it starts with music, then goes into movies, then it talks about technology. But the idea here is that how anything is created, it's by remixing the stuff that we already have. These are the basic elements of creativity. Copy, transform, and combine. The genes in our bodies can be traced back over three and a half billion years to a single organism, LUCA, the last universal common ancestor. As LUCA reproduced, its genes copied and copied and copied and copied. Sometimes with mistakes, they transformed. Over time, this produced every one of the billions of species of life on Earth. Some of these adopted sexual reproduction, combining the genes of individuals, and altogether, the best adapted life forms prospered. This is evolution. Copy, transform, and combine. And culture evolves in a similar way, but the elements aren't genes, they're memes. Ideas, behaviors, skills. Memes are copied, transformed, and combined. And the dominant ideas of our time are the memes that spread the most. This is social evolution. Copy, transform, and combine. It's who we are, it's how we live, and of course, it's how we create. Our new ideas evolve from the old ones. Ideas are regarded as property, as unique and original lots with distinct boundaries. But ideas aren't so tidy. They're layered, they're interwoven, they're tangled. And when the system conflicts with the reality, the system starts to fail. Everything is a remix. So what we're calling novel thoughts are just new remixes. And that's evolution. You don't need a soul or a spirit to make that kind of thing happen. We do know if we're being conformist or if we're acting more on our own wishes and desires. We can tell that right now. We know if we're doing that right now or not. And if we do become more autonomous, then we are freer from the constraints and demands of a herd mentality. And we can do that whether or not there's brain determinism. Maybe my brain's totally determined right now. I can still make that choice. And the one is free and the other isn't free. You don't have to wait way down the road when we understand all of neurophysiology and can explain all of evil behavior according to Sam Harris. Whether you know all of the functioning of neurophysiology, you do know if you're being a conformist. This, this stuff blows my mind. You know if you're being a conformist. So conformists all know that they're being conformists. So atheists, when they get outside of the tradition and they become atheists and they go to atheist groups, they all know that they're being conformists. You think if you went up to these free thinking skeptics and said to them, you realize you're being conformists and part of a herd mentality right now, right? They would be like, oh yeah, yeah, of course, no. This is not how things work. Just because you get a meta perspective where you slightly transcend the culture doesn't mean that you now have free will. So let's do some of this aqual analysis for Ken Wilber and Sam Harris. Let's start with Sam Harris. Sam Harris includes all four quadrants and is probably actually the most true to integral methodological pluralism of the three of these guys. He does not include stages of development. So this is a major missing ingredient from Sam's perspective. In some part, implicitly including stages, I would say. Almost want to give him half credit for it because he definitely can tell the difference between fundamentalists and moderates, between atheists and postmodernists. So I actually think with the right introduction, he would be very sympathetic to stages. I don't really hear Sam Harris talk about lines explicitly, but he seems to include them. Understanding that different people have their different areas of expertise, that seems to be something that he's mentioned on a couple different occasions. So we can include that. When it comes to states, actually Sam Harris has developed this meditation program and seems to be pretty fluent in states. And in my opinion, he does so more skillfully than Wilbur. I haven't heard Sam talk about types, but I'm pretty sure he includes them or would have no problem with them. So Sam Harris definitely has some super high-minded ideas up here about how we can take these integral ideas and make the world better with them. That stuff is awesome. It seemed like for a while he had some issues with pre-trans fallacy number one, but more and more we're seeing him have a more healthy relationship with transrational poetry. And when he's talking to Jordan Peterson, basically I think what he's saying is, I realize there's value in this stuff, but how can we get at the value and avoid some of the terrible pitfalls of the past. And Jordan Peterson just doesn't know the answer to that question. I think with the right introduction, he would be very sympathetic to a healthy integration of religion and spiritual practice. I just think that he hasn't really heard anybody as of yet who can skillfully explain to him what that looks like and how we can avoid some of the problems. Actually, I think if you look at a lot of Sam Harris's ideas, his ideas about gun control, extending care to animals and immigration, things like this, they all are these nuanced, integral perspectives 
perspectives, taking into account a lot of these factors. All right, let's talk about Wilbur. When it comes to quadrants, Wilbur does include all four quadrants, but he tends to overemphasize and favor the upper left quadrant, so that's a problem. He talks about stages, but he ends up perverting those stages in favor of his bias, so that's a major problem. I could probably say the same thing about lines, because obviously he's tried to throw Orobindo state stages on top of Piaget, where they don't really belong, and so this is clearly a corruption of the meta-analysis of the different lines. But maybe we'll just give him the maybe on this one. States. Of course Wilbur includes states, and this is the guy from which we get the Wilbur Combs matrix where we can get this horizontal and vertical waking up and growing up. Really good tool to be able to understand states in a developmental context. He gives us all of these great maps and distinctions, but then he of course understands these states in the light of his Eastern worldview, and that again corrupts his thing. So let's give him the maybe. Types, of course. Everyone's doing good on types. Let's give them the green light on the types. Notice when we compare, Peterson and Wilbur are not doing as good as Harris is when it comes to having a healthy integral perspective. And of course, Wilbur and Peterson both have the same problem of convoluting everything back into their tradition and this messes up their integration. While you might want to say this might be true of Sam Harris too, right? Like he's an academic or he's a scientist. But again, all this does for him is it makes him rigorous. It gives him intellectual honesty and humility to the point where he won't overstep his bounds. So he tends to be kind of a hard agnostic and he won't make claims beyond his ability to know. I personally wouldn't call that bias. I would call that an inherent lack of bias. So when we look at what Wilbur is doing, he of course came up with the integral map. He's put together all these factors. He's the one that said that we should include them all. But of course, pre-trans fallacy number two, he still holds on to the literal version of these Eastern dogmatic worldviews and that becomes highly problematic. He's still got some magical thinking down here. He believes in psychics and magical blessings on crops. I'll put a couple links down below to articles about this kind of stuff. He's got issues with his ego and shadow. I think white privilege is also a problem and why he doesn't see a problem with capitalism and just wants to translate all the time. Some people have also suggested that money and profit have corrupted integral projects. So Wilbur has some serious shadow work to do, but of course he's the first word on this subject. He came up with a lot of this stuff. Generally the first word on a subject doesn't get it perfectly. Generally, it's the people who come a generation or so after them who see both the criticism and their project and go, okay, this is good stuff. And these criticisms are true too. So how can we integrate the, the criticisms of Integral and Integral to create Integral 2.0 and take this project further? And that's what we really need to be doing. And so just as I'm putting the finishing touches on this video here, this new video from Rebel Wisdom comes out. And this guy's making a lot of the same points that I'm making. So I think this is a really good companion piece to this video that you're watching now. I would suggest that you check it out. I think Jamie Wheel does a great job making a lot of these criticisms. And I think I go a little bit more into detail about what's actually going on with these people, not just Wilbur. And so I hope this helps. Big thanks to Rebel Wisdom for doing all this work and getting all these voices on the record. If you ever want to have me on, hit me up. Thanks everybody so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, ring that bell, support me on Patreon, and check out other videos on the channel. Peace.